Hey all, Kelly Nagel here for what is the pinnacle of our season. Over the last several months, we've looked at how business, society, and politics impact social protests and sports by either elevating or diminishing athletes' voices. We've talked with thought leaders, activists, and athletes to understand the complexities of this topic and widen our perspective of how social justice movements impact both sports and athletes themselves. Today's episode helps us digest all of these conversations and offers a way to address racial injustice in sports and society, thanks to nine brilliant Team Think Tank Project Research Associates. Jack Baranowski, Jared Cannon, Jeremy Semino, Gwen Craney, Nolan Eichhorn, Jack James, Rohan Rathode, Savannah Riera, and Kira Turpey spent 12 weeks with the Team Think Tank Project as research associates of the Winter Research Cohort. They spent hours absorbing different perspectives, educating themselves on the history of social protests and sports, and developing a policy framework, documentary, and even a children's book as a way to create change. Our episode today captures all of their work as it was revealed at the Policy Framework launch party. Their insights are remarkable, and if you need a dose of inspiration about the future leaders of our society, you'll get it in this episode. Enjoy. But what we're facing isn't a political issue, it's, it's more of a civil rights, human rights issue. And I think that this year um, it was it, it was there, plain black and white. You couldn't paint the picture any more vividly. But in order for change to take place, you have to have a change agent in position. You need mm-hmm. to have someone that is <clears throat> dedicated. I mean, I think that they should, if they're white students, should be listening to their black fellow students and brown fellow students to learn about what their lives are really like as opposed to what they might imagine. Uh, and mainly the, what I would tell them is, you know, don't sit on the sidelines. You, everybody can't be in, in, uh, on the front lines, but everybody's got to be off the sidelines. I just think your support is invaluable. Um, I think when you take that step to really show yourself as an ally, that like reaches another level of comfort. And also it shows that you are kind of willing to go out of your way to make the effort to be uncomfortable so that we kind of can have that sense of comfort. Um, So that's really one thing that I find um, invaluable and I kind of look for when I'm searching for people to surround myself with and when I kind of create these conversations and dialogue with my peers. A group like this for uh, is just extremely invaluable because uh, it just shows that people are looking for ways to help Uh, as we all continue to like learn and grow, we can help others uh, outside of this group learn and grow and how to become uh, advocates. There's an indoctrination. There's a conditioning of the way to do things. And when you step out of that box, a lot of people don't want, they don't want that type of friction in their life. They don't want those risks. I understand it. I'm not mad at you, but if you really want change, you have to think outside the box. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to say and do things that, aren't within the, aren't the ordinary. Really, y'all put something on my mind. You don't, you might not know it, but I'm going back to the drawing board and and rethink some things. So I appreciate you. So one of the things that we're looking to do is it's a 12 week program, 12 week program. uh, We're we're about about three weeks into it now, uh, but in late March, early April, we're going to publish content. We're going to publish policy work that says, this is what we found. This is what we understand mm-hmm. to be relevant. This is what we want to see happen. We'll share that with you. We'd love to hear your thoughts Please. on it. Please do. So you a real think tank. Yes, indeed. We are a real think tank. We are the teen think tank project. Uh, my name is Matthew DeSantis. Those individuals that you saw, are our colleagues. They were our collaborators. Uh, They were our co-creators. They were our guides in a 12-week journey that uh, myself, my co-founder, Kelly Nagel, and my nine exceptional high school colleagues embarked on over the last three months. On January 5th, 2021, the Teen Think Tank Project met for the first time 
embarking on a path that will lead them to meet multiple amazing people on the track to learn more about social protests and sports and all that goes along with it. One of the first people our research group looked at was Dr. Richard Labchick. From business.ucf.edu, Labchick is a human rights activist, pioneer for racial equality, an internationally recognized expert on sports issues, and scholar, and an author. He's often described as the racial conscious of sport. He brought his commitment to equality and his belief that sport can be an effective instrument of positive social change to the University of Central Florida, where he accepted an endowed chair in August 2001. Lapchik became the only person named as one of the 100 most powerful people in sport to head up a sport management program. He remains president of the Institute for Sport and Social Justice, formerly the National Consortium for Academics and Sports, and helped bring the national office to UCF. Uh, welcome, Dr. Richard Lapchik. It is a privilege to have you joining us on Here's the Problem podcast today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to it. And I'd love to just start with how did you start with building a life and a career at the intersection of sports and social justice? Well, it goes way back. Um, literally, when I was five years old, I looked outside my bedroom window in Yonkers, New York, where I was being raised and saw my father's image swinging from a tree with people under the tree picketing. And for several years after that, I'd pick up the extension phone in our house and hear racial epithet after racial epithet being held at him. As a five, six, and seven-year-old, I had no idea what it was all about, except that a lot of people hated my best friend. And I, as I got older, I was able to appreciate that what it was about was as the coach of the New York Knicks, he had signed the first African-American player in the history of the NBA, Matt Sweetwater Clifton, a week before the NBA draft that year when Syracuse uh, drafted Earl Lloyd and the... Uh, Celtics drafted Chuck Cooper and they became the first three black players. The league is now 80% black, uh, but in 1950, there were a lot of people in this country uh, who didn't want it to become that. They wanted an all white league. From our meeting with Dr. Richard Lapchik, we learned that America has not changed much, as we are still fighting a lot of the same issues, and those issues affect people of color every day. Also, we learned that sports brings these issues that people do not want to talk about to light in a way that otherwise would not have happened. The next person we are going to look at is WNBA player Essence Carson. Essence Carson is a social activist and 13-year WNBA veteran. Carson has been very influential recently during the Black Lives Matter protests, and she lent her voice to many platforms to spread knowledge about social issues that are affecting the lives of women and people of color today. Thanks for joining me this morning. Really great to have you. It was good to be here. Thanks for having me. So here's the problem. Sports and social justice. And just saying that phrase conjures up a diverse array of reactions. This year's WNBA season was certainly unique for a lot of reasons, you know, pandemic aside. Um, but in the sense of the league fully embraced social justice and, and social protest movements um, that really made you stand out from other organizations? Um, I mean, of course, as, as players, we, we took a stand this year. We definitely took a stand. There were so many people that were willing to, to not suit up and, and head out there on that court because this issue is bigger than the game of, of basketball, right? We're talking about the game of life. I believe it initially started out, out as players led, as player led, and then I believe the league ultimately joined full fledged. And you 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 can't ask for well at, at that time what we were asking for um, there there wasn't much else you could ask for. The idea was to be able to use that platform for our cause mm. at any given time, no matter what. And that was the one, that was a compromise that we came to. Um, that was the, the only way that you would get us down to the bubble is if we were allowed to use our platform for social change. Thanks to Essence Carson, we were able to see that the players were the ones who started the movements, causing the teams and organizations to follow. 
Carson taught us that if we want to protest, we have to be willing to sacrifice. Carson let us see into the eyes of a woman social activist heavily revered in her field. She showed us how women in the WNBA have a lot more to lose comparatively to men in the NBA because of their popularity. However, this still has not stopped them from trying to make drastic social change. Finally, we will look at our meeting with Mahmoud Abdul Arouf. Mahmoud Abdul Arouf, to me, was a former NBA player. He was a third overall pick in the NBA draft and former player for the Denver Nuggets, Sacramento Kings, and Vancouver Grizzlies. Uh, I see him as a leading figure in sports protest and as a quote unquote predecessor to Colin Kaepernick due to your protests during the national anthem in the NBA. So Mahmoud Abdul Rauf is not just about basketball. He's a convert to Islam who's inspired by Malcolm X, consumed Islamic literature, and also found a conflict between his religion and uh, standing for the flag. And because of that conflict in 1996, he was suspended by NBA Commissioner David Stern for not standing for the national anthem. But after one game of that suspension, he came to a compromise with the league, stating that he would stand for the anthem, but would continue in protest by bowing his head and praying during it. Do you realize that you've had an impact on change, right? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you do when you hear the, the fact that you hear people talking about it. There's, a, there's an impact, but how much of an impact, we won't really know. And sometimes in the process of changing something, you change. Like the thoughts you had initially may evolve to become something even bigger. Martin Luther King, for example, in the end of his life, he wasn't the same Martin Luther King that he started off as, and a lot of leaders weren't. He mentioned to Belafonte in one of his meetings, he said, listen, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I think I've messed up. I think I've integrated my people into an already burning house. He began to think differently on how the world was. He said the biggest purveyor of, uh, of violence in the world is American imperialism. These were things that he didn't see or didn't communicate and articulate before. So sometimes where you start off is not where you end. And sometimes the things that you do may not be felt in your lifetime, but other people, just like the seed you plant, they may reap the benefits of what you what you what what you laid and what you what you planted. Um, but as as Richard Itten said, a political scientist, he said that we have to caution against viewing protest, against viewing resistance as inherently revolutionary. He said because once it becomes routine, it's easily accepted or anticipated by the dominant authorities and therefore easily molded and shaped into into their hegemonic understanding of things, which to me meant that. You know, when, when protest and resistance become fashionable, right, it loses its power. And we have to be careful not to allow that to happen. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf gave us the first account of how professional athletes who are trying to make social change are treated. Mahmoud taught us that in order to make social change, we have to be radical and not to be afraid about saying the truth, even if it may hurt someone's feelings. Mahmoud finally showed us that we are all humans first, and then politicians and athletes. Thank you for listening to our process of learning about social protests in sports. We hope that what we have learned will contribute to effective social change in the world. We would also like to give a special thanks to everyone else who offered their insight on social protests in all of its forms. Your work and knowledge is very much appreciated. Big thank you to my co-founder and our winter research cohort coordinator, Matthew DeSantis, our exceptional research associates, Jack, Jared, Jeremy, Gwen, Nolan, Jack, Rohan, Savannah, and Kira, along with everyone who supported them. You can view their research and documentary at teamthinktankproject.com slash 21winter. That's teamthinktankproject.com slash 21winter. And if you join our email list, you'll get updates on their children's book release. I'd also like to thank all those who made this podcast possible. Our wonderful production team, the George Milton Group, and Winnie the Mood for our theme song. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the listener. And let us know you're listening. Subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And follow us at problem underscore pod. For more information on today's topic or to find out more about social justice programming for exceptional teams, 
please follow the Teen Think Tank Project at teen underscore think tank or visit us at teenthinktankproject.com. We'll be back next week with a bonus episode before we get right into season three. Until next time, I'm Kelly Nagel.